Welcome to One Bills Light, the snack size version of our daily show, One Bills Live, where we spin things a bit faster and a bit different. In this episode, we discuss Buffalo's possible strategy in free agency. Marcellus Wiley reminisces with us about the start of his NFL career in Buffalo, and we ask Steve about the pull of a tight knit team when a free agent decision must be made. Let's get it! Steve Tasker, who has been all over the field. Kind of unique. He was kind of a dual role player for you. Steve. A balloon. Steve. A blimp. <laughs> We're not even in the stratosphere of normalcy. Thanks for joining us here on One Bill's Light, available on all your podcast platforms and on YouTube on the Buffalo Bills channel, where you can watch us as well as listen. Steve Tasker and Chris Brown with you. And Steve, free agency sits less than two weeks away. And we've spent so much time assessing what the market will look like, particularly on our daily show, One Bill's Live. Supply will outpace demand with salary cap casualties. It'll be a buyer's market, lots of one-year contracts. The market will soften quickly as teams have less cap space to utilize. That's what we expect the market at large to look like. But what we haven't really discussed specifically is what we anticipate the Bill's strategy to be in the market much at all. So I ask you, what do you believe the Bills' strategy to be in free agency. I think there's no question they've kind of got to play a defensive game because they they don't have cap space right now to really make a big splash. And Brandon Bean said we're not going to make a big splash. However, we know this to be true. They kick the tires on every single player they think that will help them. So they're going to find out if they can get a guy at a bargain price. I think the the plan is, or if I can prognosticate is I think how it will work out is I think the Bills will sit tight early on in free agency. Now, certainly they'll be on the phone. Uh, they'll talk, call all the players they think are significant upgrades to their current roster. They're going to find out if they can get a guy like that on a team-friendly deal, one that they can make work. They will have a plan for freeing up cap space. They'll have guys on the line, if not before free agency, then certainly during free agency to say, listen, we need to restructure your deal to give us some cap relief because we got a chance to get a guy who's really going to help us. Or if not... They'll have a list, a short list of guys who they'll say, listen, we're going to have to release you, uh, like we've seen so many other teams do. And they'll, they'll free up cap space that way. But I think if they do sign free agents, it'll be days into free agency yeah. where those guys, those particular players, will be, A, a significant upgrade to the current guy that the Bills have on their roster, B, amenable to signing a team-friendly deal that deep into free agency, knowing they're not going to hit that first wave and hit a home run financially. And... It'll be also a time when we see the Bills clear some cap space to make it happen. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. I I see them taking a lying-in-the-weeds type approach, not big players in that initial wave of free agency, the first one to four days when all the big names sign, get their money. But I will say this. (laughs) I think they're going to be reactionary in a lot of ways, not proactive because of their restrictive cap situation. We saw how they reacted when J.J. Watt became available. They jumped into the fray and said, even though this guy is going to command a high salary, let's at least explore it because he would make us significantly better. In the end, it turned into a bidding war, and the Bills had to pull out of that wisely. Um, But I think they are certainly preparing any and all contingencies from this standpoint. They look at the market as it currently sits in terms of who they anticipate will be available once they get to March 17th and beyond. And then they also project who are likely salary cap casualties that we might be interested in and may take a more aggressive approach to should they become available. And then what cap decisions do we have to make to make adding a player like that possible? And That's a very reactionary thing, but you have to be able to push that button immediately if you want in on on a player like that. I mean, for example, you know, let's just because it's been talked about already. Let's just say Von Miller, okay? Von Miller is still a member of the Broncos right now, but he has a year left on his deal. It's similar to the J.J. Watt situation. It's $17-plus million. The Broncos are tight on the cap. They're probably not not going to – keep him on the roster they're probably going to move on from him and he'll be thrust out into the market but it may not happen 
until March 16th. Right. Um, if that's the case, now the Bills have to enact perhaps a contingency plan if they're interested in a player of his caliber and say, okay, if Von Miller gets clipped, we have to make decisions A, B, and C with our roster to have enough cap space to at least compete for his services, but that button is going to, that eject button on whatever the contingency plan is, cutting player A and B and restructuring player C, that all has to take place quickly. And if there's a restructure involved, that guy has to be ready to sign off on that. So those discussions have to be taking place now, I would think. Right. So, and that's the most interesting thing to me, Steve, about this bill strategy is some teams are going to take a similar approach to that of the bills, while others are going to take a much different tact in terms of getting what they want on the free agent market. So with the, I guess the next question then, Steve, is with the Bills getting to the Final Four this past season and likely see themselves as close to reaching the Super Bowl, does that change the description of the kinds of players they're looking to acquire in free agency? Because when they undertook oh, yeah. this thing, there was a long-range yeah. view. I don't know if the range is as as um, as long and distant as it once was. It it becomes a question of, and and think about this: the Buffalo is now a much much more attractive destination for free agents yes. than it has been in past years and past decades. And also, not only because of the fact that they're on the, they seem to be on the doorstep. They seem to be close to to getting over that mountain and getting to the Super Bowl, which is what players I think would love. But it's also uh, a place where on a, a free agent who now with the cap situation around the league and the, and going forward where the cap is going to bounce forward really strong in a rebound year after it's been chopped by $25, 30000000 million this year in the coming year, the year after it's going to be big. There's going to be a lot of money on the table. So Buffalo will be once again in a great position to get guys on short-term one-time deals, mm -hmm. one prove-it deals, who want to not only, A, give a chance to be the best version of themselves, which is what Buffalo is all about, B, get on a really good team that's going to get some national attention on the big on the grand High scale. High-profile exposure. High-profile exposure. And C, give you a deal that gives you a chance to jump out next year and take advantage of this same market again when a lot more teams are going to mm -hmm. have money to spend. Uh, all of those things work in Buffalo's favor, but I don't think it changes the type of player Buffalo is looking for. Certainly, it might be a wider range of players who are saying, listen, i got to get into Buffalo. There might be a handful more players saying, listen, that's the spot for me if I can get in. But it, it's also, it comes down to the, how Buffalo has evaluated their own guys. Buffalo Bills fans, and we've talked about it at length, you look at the roster and there's four likely candidates for guys who may be an, a way for Buffalo to jettison some salary cap. Guys we like, John Brown, Vernon Butler, Mario Addison, Quentin Jefferson, those four guys are the most likely candidates to say, listen, I don't, you know, we can get a guy who is an upgrade with that salary cap room. Yeah. But here's the thing, too. I mean, you, you want to start trading guys out like that? I, I don't know. I don't know. Is there a guy who gives you an upgrade at that spot? Is there a guy who wants to, you know, jump out in that market? Or are there yeah. going to be some surprises, which we think there are? You... The Bills have shown they're not afraid to shuffle the deck if they believe right. the combination of players in their eyes will make them a better football team. I guess when I asked you that question, I am asking it from the standpoint of, do you have a separate short-term plan now prior to extensions for Josh Allen and eventually Tremaine Edmonds, where beyond those contract extensions, your plan cap-wise may have to be different because of all the money that's going to be committed, chiefly to the quarterback? Or do you say, this is probably what we're going to commit to quarterback and linebacker cornerstone players, let's structure contracts long-term so we're not in this constant cycle of shuffling the roster one year after another? Or maybe we like the one-year approach, right. And we'll keep doing that, hoping to hit on the right combination that can get us over the hump. That, that's the thing that's fascinating to me. Right. And I don't know that the restrictive cap or the impending extensions for people like Josh Allen and Tremaine Edwards will change their approach at all. It may not. I don't think it will. Because you can always create yeah. cap space. I don't think it will. I don't think it will. And I don't think they're going to take a, 
take, for instance, take a swing for the fence. I've said this on the show. The Bills and some of the Bills fan base, we've heard this on our show at Daily Show. They think, man, it's time. It's got, you got to do right. it right now. The Bills are already there. They were there last year. They won 13 games. They won 15 games overall in the season, 13 regular season games. They're, you're already at the point where you're in the conversation for the Super Bowl. You just keep on keeping on. My, my point is this. You don't have to do anything tremendous to get over the hump, say, the Kansas City Chiefs. You just got to play better on the day you play the Chiefs. Right. At the um, so I don't think they're going to diverge from this plan that's got them to this point. This is a point. This is a, a plan that has kept them competitive. Three out of the last four years, they're in the super in the uh, playoffs. Right. So that's the plan they want to adhere to. And if there's a way to stay within that finan- the financial parameters of that plan, they'll do it. Yeah. But I don't think it's time for them to take that big splash, knowing that down the road they're going to have to pay for it. I just you look at what Kansas City has done, and granted, they're eight years into their model. The Bills are only entering year five. But they've made a habit of continually adding pieces, weapons, particularly on the offensive side of the ball. It didn't matter that they had Sammy Watkins and Tyreek Hill on the roster and Travis Kelsey. They drafted me, Cole Hardman, in the second right. round. They added Clyde Edwards-Alaire last year. Uh, you know, they, they kept adding. They didn't stand. And that was after winning the Super Bowl, Yes. you know, with Clyde Edwards-Alaire being added. So, and I understand it was part due in part to the fact that they had some some guys that were you know, going to opt out and whatnot, or, or the anticipation that they might. But they kept adding, even after they won the whole thing. So I just wonder how influenced the Bills' plan might be with respect to that. And I know you don't want to just put all your eggs in one basket and say, we got to get by the Chiefs, but that's the team that you struggled against the most last year, and they were responsible for two of your four losses on the season. So there has to be some level of attention paid to that and it has to be incorporated at least to some degree, I would think, into your plan. It'll just be interesting to see how it plays out once these salary cap casualties get flushed into the market, how much it alters, how aggressive or passive the bills are with their free agency. All right, enough about that, because it's time, Steve, for the numbers game, which will deal with NFL head coaches and their team's ability to finish games when leading At the half, I think most Bills fans know, because they've seen this number thrown out there before, since Sean McDermott became head coach of the Bills in 2017, he has a record of 30-2 and when his Bills team is leading at halftime. It's very impressive. That 938 winning percentage, however, is fifth best in the league. Fifth best. Over that four-year span. Wow. Since Since he became head coach of the Bills, he has the fifth best One loss record when his team is leading at halftime. So the challenge to you today, Steve. All right. Can you name the four NFL head coaches who have a better winning percentage when their team is leading at halftime since 2017 than Sean McDermott? Let's get it going, Steve. Let's see how you do here. Mm. Better winning. Who wins games when they're leading at halftime? I'll start with the obvious, Andy Reid. Andy Reid is number seven on this list. He is actually behind one Sean McDermott. He is 37 and three, 925 winning percentage. All right. Here's one from, here's one, Sean McVay. Sean McVay is tied for first 1,000%. He has never lost as really? a head coach. He is 30. Five and oh. Since two, now this is 2017. So Since there could 2017. be some, Could there? There is could, no there is no qualifying limit for number of games. Right, right. I'm just asking this. Are there some coaches who have been coaching since before 2017? Oh yes. Okay. All right. Yes. How about this, Pete Carroll? Pete Carroll is not on this list at all. Not even in the top ten. Belichick. Belichick is eighth. All right. So he's he's behind Sean McDermott, 34 and three with a 919 winning percentage. I will say this, Kyle Shanahan. Shanahan not on this list at all. Now, he got hit last year with, you know, the injury-riddled season, finishing last in the NFC West, so that hurt him precipitously on this list. How about this? Mike Vrabel. Vrabel is ninth. Gosh. He's 17-2, and two, and that mm. only gives him a winning percentage of 895. Right, you. You're talking, I mean, 30-2. Wow, and two. you got to be better than 30-2. and two. Like, your winning percentage Who has got to be almost perfect. 
Now, and play, oh, okay. Uh, 2017. Uh, and I'm not sure if these. How about uh, the guy in Green Bay, Lafleur? Lafleur is correct. He is third on this list, 20 and one. All right, so Nine I got the tie. 52 winning percentage. I got the tie for first. To yeah, get, you got one of the top got, guys, and you got Lafleur. So you got, got two more guys to get here. The guy who's tied with McVeigh, and the guy who's in between Lafleur and McDermott. Frank Reich. It is not Frank Reich. Frank is not <laughs> Frank. He is help not me on out. this list. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, there is a relatively new coach on this list, and there and and he's probably oh, and he's up high because the guy the guy in Carolina. Um, I don't even know. I can't even think of his name. It is not Matt Rule. Not Matt Rule. No, All he's right. not on this list. Um, and then there is another coach who's been doing this for a while, but since 2017, he's been killing it. So you want to think of a Ron team. Rivera. Ron Rivera is 10th on this list. That is not <clears throat> a ding, guys. Buzz him up. Um, Thank you. <laughs> he's 10th on this list between Carolina and Washington. 25 and 3 for an 893 win wow, percentage. I mean, you're you're naming good guys, but this is like the tippy top of the mountain here. You know? Uh, so I will say the one guy that are is. Are they all still head coaching this? this they are. Their... They are. The one guy that is at, tied with McVeigh has not been a head coach for very long, which obviously helps him with the perfect winning percentage. Because you know that. McVeigh is 35 and 0. So this guy also has to be undefeated. Right. When it's got to be like it's got to be like uh, But he Cliff doesn't Kingsbury. have a 35 game sample. Cliff Kingsbury. Yeah, it's not Cliff Kingsbury. Yeah. Okay. But it's not someone with a 35 game sample. He's got a much smaller sample size which helps him here in this category. What's the uh, now I'm having trouble thinking of the guy in Denver. Not Denver. No. And then there's a longtime head coach who's been in one place for quite some time and, and has not, won a ton of games. It's not Belichick. We already tried that. That's right. And I said Pete Carroll. Not him. Wait a minute. i got to be down the list now. Hold. Yeah, <clears> just <throat> work your way I gotta through find the league, a list of and I think you'll somewhere. find him in short order. All right, hold on. I'll get it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this. I feel like you entered this numbers game without a, a concrete plan. And narrow. Mike Tomlin. It is not Mike Tomlin. He's not even in the top oh. ten. John Harbaugh. John Harbaugh is sixth. He's right behind Sean McDermott. Forty and three since 2017. 930 Sh- winning. Percentage. Sean. Sean in New Orleans. Sean. Sean Payton Sean is Payton. correct, Steve. He Sean is fourth. Payton. Okay. 38 and two I'm since struggling. 2017. So I got one guy left. Yeah, one guy left. And it's a guy you like as a head coach. You've said this on the air several times. You like this guy? No. Think he's good for this team? Oh, he's still coaching, though. Okay. He is still coaching. Um, oh, Stefanski. Kevin Stefanski, 10-0 and 0 in his first year as head coach of the Browns, tied with Sean McVay. Now, Sean McVay's is far more impressive. 35-0. and 35-0. and 0. That is. That's a big number. That's some doing. That's a big now, number. Now, I got to say this. Not for nothing, but three of the top five named Sean. Maybe there's something there. McDermott, McVeigh, and Peyton. Peyton. Yeah. Something's Hire there. a head coach whose first name is Sean. I mean, my goodness. Or uh, even nickname Sean. You want guys to close out games? That's your ticket. I mean, that was. <laughs> uh, but like this to, is an impressive Eric, list. B- Eric Bienemy, we'd like to, you to change your name to Sean. Yeah, Sean Bienemy. This, we'll uh, this is the top 10 list because this is an impressive list of coaches yeah. Sean McVeigh, Kevin Stefanski, Matt LaFleur, Sean Payton, Sean McDermott, John Harbaugh, Andy Reid, Bill Belichick, Mike Grable, and Ron Rivera. That's a group. That's it's a, a group. It's a pretty good group. So those are your top 10 coaches since 2017 with the best one loss records after halftime, or when leading at halftime, I should say. Um, the biggest sample size goes to Harbaugh at a total of 43 games, Andy Reid and Sean Payton with a total of 40 games, Bill Belichick 37, Sean McVay 35. Yeah, so one. that is good stuff right there. Thought that'd be an interesting test in the numbers game. Good guesses there by Steve. We yep. move along now, though, to our featured interview. It's former Bills defensive end and current co-host of Speak for Yourself with Emmanuel Acho. It is one Marcellus Wiley, author of the book, Never Shut Up the Life's Opinions and Unexpected Adventures. 
of an NFL outlier is the man we know as Wild Style. It is one Marcellus <laughs> Wiley. Marcellus, how you doing, man? What's shaking? Oh, a little mild style now, man. I'm 46. <laughs> a lot of changed over the years, brothers. How you guys? Uh, We're doing, doing really good. good. We're doing good. So uh, from one defensive end to another, just give me your initial uh, thoughts on the J.J. Watt deal yesterday. Um, first, the destination, Arizona. And second, the guaranteed money for a 32-year-old. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, what... When I saw the move, I wasn't as surprised as the reaction was. Uh, a lot of times, players, especially in the latter stages of their career, people assume that they're just chasing a ring. And even though that's true for a lot of guys, there are also a lot of guys who want to chase an opportunity, and that opportunity is so great in terms of the money, in terms of the compensation, in terms of how they're still going to respect you like the other team did, that that becomes as important as chasing that ring. Uh, I think it's really a culmination of all the things that you look for when you're talking about a future destination. Arizona's a sneaky team. They're scary because this is an 8-8 eight and eight team that had some good times, especially starting off the season, what, 6-2, and two, and having – to be a tough out in that division that they play in, which is a very tough division. So if you're J.J. Watt, you're sitting there thinking, I don't want to just look like I'm chasing money, but I do want to get paid. Um, his production in sacks has dropped, but in terms of him still putting pressure on the quarterbacks, especially tackles for loss in the backfield, J.J. Watt is still a monster to deal with. Obviously, he's not as explosive as he once was, but in terms of – him being smart at the position, him still having the handcraft to beat a one-on-one -on -one block, he's still a top-notch pass rusher and defender. So I wasn't as shocked as everyone else, and I remind people that the Tampa Bay Bucks, they were a 7-9 team. They got their quarterback. All of a sudden, they won their Super Bowl. Let's see the maturity of a Kyle Murray, also with a defense that's loaded with a J.J. Watt. Maybe they can make some noise. What will J.J. have to do to live up to 15.5 a year? <laughs> yeah, on the field, uh, he has to do a lot. Off the field, his presence alone already has sparked interest, and you can see how the fan base is electrified, and they're excited because last year they had huge expectations. They started off fast, and then they faltered down the stretch. Uh, now you see a team that's going to be box office in terms of attraction, in terms of being a destination, but now you got to back that up with actual performance. J.J. Watt, it's, it's so funny, man. When you're a pass rusher, the first thing that goes is you 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 lose that, that engine, that sixth gear. So you're not as the same guy in terms of explosiveness and burst. But then once you get over 30, no matter how well you're playing, people are just holding their breath for you to decline. His sacks were down. Five sacks is not J.J. Watt production. However, he had the second fewest pass rush attempts in his career. For, the, for those out there who don't know what that means, basically they were getting beat up so many times that teams were running the ball against them more so than passing the ball against them, and he didn't have the same amount of opportunities to get those same sacks. So this could be a year where he could break through once again and show us the old J.J. Watt. What is... And, and I realize it was at two different times in respective careers. He's going to his second NFL club as a 32-year-old. You did it in the prime of your career going out to San Diego. But you still had expectations to live up to. Obviously, you came through. I think you had 12 and a half sacks your first year in San Diego, went to the Pro 13, Bowl. 13, 13. 13, sorry. sorry. <laughs> My bad. Um, but, low, but seriously, like maybe just explain the level of pressure that's involved when you go to a new team with the big money deal, you got to come through on that. Now, I know J.J. comes with a lot more cachet, having been a three-time defensive player of the year. I mean, you didn't have all of that on your resume yet, but yeah. just maybe outline the, the, the level of pressure involved to live up to that kind of a deal. Yeah, it's crazy, man. I mean, I had two pressure-filled years in terms of expectations. The first year was in Buffalo, actually, when they released Bruce Smith, Andre yep. Reed, Thurman Thomas all on the same day. And here I am, a fourth-year player, but never been a starter. And now it's my position. And it's the position that was held by Bruce Smith. And then I go into camp, and I have a back surgery, and I can't even walk in training camp, let alone play the defensive end position 
and take over for a Bruce Smith, like the best ever to do it. So that was pressure field. But um, I, I came I came through that year, had my 10 and a half sacks. And then I go to San Diego where they have Junior Seau, Rodney Harrison. And here I come one year as a starter and I'm making more money than all of the other great players on that team. And be, besides the jokes, because they laugh at you all the time, they call you big money and they make you pay all the bills and tabs everywhere you go. Besides the laughter that comes from that is a serious undertone of, hey, you, you made this money, now earn this money. And I think the greatest thing about it all that you have to remember is whatever got you here is gonna get you there. What does that mean? The belief in yourself and your performance is why you were paid that much, J.J. Watt. So it's still in you. Now, all you have to do is bring it out. And circumstances do play a part. Like I said, last year, he just wasn't given the same amount of opportunities to rush yeah. the passer. And when you're that old and already been injury prone, and then all of a sudden they see that big stat of sacks go down, then everyone starts to cave in on you. But J.J. Watt still has a lot of football, I think, left in him, and he can go out there and surprise the many. We just saw Kyle Van Noy released by the Dolphins about 15, 20 minutes ago. A guy just last year signed a $51 million four-year deal. He gets kicked to the curb. The, cap, the cap's going to get chopped by $30 million instead of going up as we usually see it. There's going to be a ton of really good football players out on the street, and it's happening right now with J.J. Watt, Kyle Van Noy. There's going to be others that follow. How do you think this is going to play out in the big picture for the NFL, not only this year going forward with a smaller cap, but maybe next year when it bounces back? Yeah, it's interesting, man. It's, it's a crazy time to be a player, a crazier time to be an agent because everyone's living off these projections, and it's affecting a lot of people. We talked about J.J. Watt and – his future. Captain America is now out of Houston and is in Arizona. Uh, you talk about Van Noy. Let's talk about Dak Prescott, a guy whose deal is still up in the air, in part because of these same projections. Going back to last year, Dak wanted to match his deal with the TV deal and with the CBA. And Jerry Jones, being a smart businessman, doesn't want it to match up with that because obviously he'll be right back at the negotiating table before you blink and getting more money. So it's crazy how it's all playing out right now. But the thing that you got to hold if you're one of those type of players is the playing performance card, which is I am a baller. No matter where I go, I can have impact. And I think it all works itself out once you're one of those players that can provide impact. So as we played the game before, Steve, you know how it goes, man. They're always looking for – the better, younger, stronger, faster, cheaper version of you. Uh, I remember when I got paid the first time, everyone kept coming up to me and saying, congratulations, Wally. You know they're upstairs trying to figure out how to get that money back right now. So it's the way the game goes. It's the nature of the beast. But if you're a baller, you'll find a home and they'll take care of you. I just wonder, Marcellus, when – you think about the free agency this year, the great anticipation is there's going to be this glut of talent thrust into the market with all these teams trying to navigate this restrictive cap and everybody's predicting this buyer's market after the initial wave. You know, the top guys are going to get their money in week one. We all know that. Yeah. But after that, the market has a, has a real likelihood of softening in a hurry um, where some guys who right now – have contracts for eight or 10 million a year are going to get clipped and they may have to play on a one year deal in the fall for maybe half that and hope they can bet on themselves and succeed with some of the circumstances that you've outlined for JJ. You know, it's a matter of circumstance. You got to, you got to hope bet on you and hope you get the opportunities to maximize your value. So when you go back into the market next year, you can swing big when the cap gets more in line with where it should be. So how un, how unnerving is that going to be for, for some of these vets, you know, going out into the market and having to prove it on a one-year deal probably in some cases? Yeah, you touched on a lot there, man. Um, it takes me to some examples of real estate. Um, and in terms of when do you sell your house? You know that you have equity in it. You know that you love it. But at the same time, when do you sell? Is it a buyer's market? Is it a seller's market? And the biggest difference between being a professional athlete and selling your home is 
you have a finite shelf life when you're an athlete. You can only yeah. play for so long. You can live in that house as long as you want to. And it's just about right now, those circumstances. And I'm glad you highlighted that because I think a lot of fans don't understand the devil in the details of being a professional athlete. So to personalize it once again, part of my decline was just lack of performance. Part of my decline was also injuries. Part of my decline also was, hey, you got rid of Junior Seau, Rodney Harrison, John Perello, all in the same year. It's like now all of that attention starts to focus in on one person instead of a collective, and therefore it's that much more difficult to be the guy. And J.J. Watt had to experience that as well. When you start to see a team not ran properly and they're starting to lose pieces around them, especially when you look at a 4-12 and 12 team, being a pass rusher on a 4-12 and 12 team is not something most guys <laughs> sign up for. I mean, you talk about third and fourth quarters, it's nothing but run defense, basically. So it's, it's crazy to have to bet on yourself in this moment. Uh, but it always levels itself out if you can endure the process. What I mean by that is I remember talking to Bruce a bunch of times, and the only reason I got more money than Bruce was my birth certificate circumstances. I was just a younger version and cheaper version and half as good as him, but that turns into more money. And it's going to work that way for these guys if they can perform on short deals as well. Because when the CBA bumps back up, when the TV deals are finalized, my goodness, they're going to be looking for guys to throw money at. And we've seen that in years past. It's just right now it's a downward cycle more than likely for the masses, but the top echelon guys will always survive this. And then going forward a year or two, you'll see the middle class starting to survive and thrive as well. You uh, you came out of Compton, California. You went to Columbia University, end up in Buffalo. Three pretty varied destinations in your life. What do you remember about your time in Buffalo? You were here for four years, and when you got out of your rookie contract, you were a highly sought after free agent yourself. How do you? What do you remember about your time here in Buffalo? Oh, man, uh, it was just so focused on football. Like everyone had their priorities in order being a Buffalo Bill. Um, it was just great fanfare. Like I remember one, I remember having a Regal Cinema card that they gave all the Buffalo Bills players. And we used to go to the movies like every single week. That was amazing. Uh, I remember how it was like this big city that felt like a, a, a small family, like Everywhere you went, people showed you a proper respect, but they also showed you a reverence, like you're a Buffalo Bill. And it was just a great introduction to the NFL, a storied franchise with a huge fan base and that they prioritized football. Uh, I remember being around guys like you, Steve, and, and like I said, Bruce, Andre, Thurman, and just seeing living legends of the game and getting to watch you guys, even when you weren't having direct contact just the osmosis of learning how this guy became so great and what he does to take care of himself on the field and off the field. So the greatest experience was just like, I went to a graduate school of greatness in terms of football as this focus. So Buffalo was amazing to me. The first winner slapped me in the face. It hit me hard. Other than that, uh, I really enjoyed everything about it. I am yeah. I am going to relay two stories, one that you told me and the other that I witnessed in the locker room. I'm going to see if you remember this, okay? So first one, we were asking you as a young player, you know, what you try to learn from Bruce. And, you know, you talk about conversations that you had with him and little tips that you tried to pick up. And then someone tried to follow up with a question saying, well, what about mimicking what he does? And you said... Uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, but you basically <laughs> said, we watch Bruce kind of bend the edge and he contorts his body in a way that I said, oh, let me try to do that. And you said you tried to do it three times in a row and every single time you fell down. Do you remember talking <laughs> about that? Oh, my God. Do I remember talking about it? I remember going through it. I remember trying it. I remember like the days, the first time I saw Bruce Smith pass rush in practice, he had on a hat, a Buffalo Bills hat. He had on some gray sweats, and his legs were crossed just standing looking at us. Like, he basically looked like your dad showed up to practice because we were all in full gear, and he was just sitting there like pops. And I was like, I know he's Bruce Smith, so he's taking it light, taking it easy. And I think finally Marv Lee was like, hey, Bruce, you going to give us a rep? 
He was like, yeah, took his hat off, put his helmet on. He's still not in full pads and everyone else is. And he did that vintage swipe move. And it's, I swear it looked like he was jogging. I swear it looked like he wasn't being intense. And it worked to perfection. And I just used to look at him and marvel, like, his hip bend, his contortion. I used to think of him as like a rubber band man. Like, he could just flex in places and ways that no one else could. And so I quickly came to realize that that's why he was the number one overall pick. That's why he's Bruce Smith. And it's okay, you can't do that. But there's something in my game that he may look at and say, hey, I don't even try that. And I was more of a power rusher than Bruce Smith. And I got labeled as Bruce Smith, who was more of a speed, quickness, elusive rusher. Yeah. I should have just thrown that label off me quickly because then I'd probably <laughs> still be playing because they would have thought of me as a run stopper. But point being, Bruce Smith was in the class by itself, and I still say it to this day. Greatest pass rusher I've ever seen. Now here's the second one, okay? It's uh, your rookie year, and the 53-man roster has just been established. So it's like early September. It's not week one yet. And you guys are in the locker room, and Pat Williams makes the team as an undrafted rookie. Okay, Pat yes. decides. Pat decides in the locker room. This is with the media in the locker room, by the way. You know, just doing our normal stuff. And Pat decides he's going to start chirping at Ted Washington. Okay, uh, from across mm. the locker room. Still a rookie here. Okay, hazing still <laughs> exists, as you know. So Pat doesn't stop talking. He's chirping, 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 chirping. I think he's got his jockey shorts on and not much else and a towel over his shoulder. He turns his head away, and in about the blink of an eye, Ted Washington is across the locker room with a roll of medical tape, and he's got Pat on the ground, flat on his stomach, and he's hog-tying him in about 10 seconds, and Pat is screaming across the locker room for you to help him. Do you remember this? Hell yeah, I remember this. Keep going. If you want me to tell it, tell me. Yeah, finish, <laughs> finish it up yesterday. for us, Marcella, it's because you didn't help him. <laughs> and, and Pat shouldn't have been chirping. Like, I, I look, I was like, Pat. See, Pat and Ted had this great relationship because Pat was like a mini version of Ted, right. and he wanted to be Ted, and I got it. Like, I wanted to be Bruce. So we had our family relationships. But I wasn't about to cross family lines, especially with Mount Washington. So I'm laughing because... <laughs> Pat would say stuff to Ted that others couldn't get away with, but even Ted would stop him at a certain point. Like, hey, Pat, like, calm down. And that day, I remember Pat, like you said, getting tied up. I remember him getting the baby powder thrown on him with the baby oil. I remember him throwing him in the hot tub. I remember them duct taping him to the goalpost. And I remember <laughs> thinking, okay, Pat's my roommate, so... I know I'm going to hear about this later if I don't jump in and help him. But I'd rather deal with the hell of Pat in a room one-on-one -on -one than Ted Washington in a locker room Yeah, anytime. that's a good choice. Because that was the biggest, strongest dude and, and the nicest cat you ever could meet. But, man, that day was hilarious. I tell that story a lot because it's just a different world now versus when we played. And you can't get away with that stuff right now. But that was a rite of passage back then. And Pat... Yeah, Pat went through it, man. He went through the fire, but he came that, out that on is, top. That was the it's, fastest I have ever seen a 315-pound man subdued in my entire life, and I don't yeah. think it'll ever be topped because I'm telling you, I told Steve this the other day right here on the show, a 380-pound man move that quick across a locker room in the blink of an eye and then subdue a 315-pound man in the span of about 15 seconds. Yeah. It was unreal, man. How about <laughs> this? I remember one day Jamie Nails was talking – and Ted looked at him. And remember how big Nails got. Yeah, like yeah. Nails was yeah. 419. I remember one day Jamie had to weigh himself. And I was like, I have to see this because he just <laughs> got too big. And I remember looking. And I first of all, it blew my mind that a scale even had a four digit in the front. But right. it went 419. I was like, damn. And as big as Nails was, because I had to go against him every single day. So I felt that pain. He never messed with Ted. No one we knew messed with Ted except Pat because Pat wanted to be Ted, and he found I've, out the hard way. I've said it a, a hundred times said, to people. Who, Ted Washington was one of the most unique athletes I have ever witnessed. He, is, he was phenomenally I, – I, he a, he's a Hall of Famer in my book because he played for uh, forever. Every defense he was ever on, every defense he was ever on was in top five rush defense. 
And I remember you get offensive linemen who would tell you, once the ball's snapped, if you let him get his hip set, you can't move him. You can get all both guards and the center. You can't move him. You watch films of Ted. The line of scrimmage never moved, man. He was there, <laughs> and it was like you had to run around him. You had to run yeah, around he him. Had, he, he had cat feet. I mean, he had little yeah. kitten feet, and you're like, this is a 300, 400-pound man, and he moved so fast. And that punch, the power of that punch. All right, since we're talking Ted, I got to get my last story off. Ted – Ted changed how I looked at the game in terms of business. One day, snowstorm, I'm stuck. I couldn't get, I couldn't get to practice. Ted picks me up. I remember sitting in his truck, and it was a mess. But he had a Hummer, and Hummers just came right. out. Arnold Schwarzenegger and Ted were the only two people with Hummers. And I was like, this is amazing. I'm in this Hummer with Big Ted, and it's just McDonald's wrappers and, and like, hot dog wrappers. Like, just a <laughs> mess, right? So I'm moving everything. And while I'm moving things, I see two of our game checks. I'm like, Ted, you got your game checks here. What you want to do here? And he was like, no, I put them in my glove compartment. Now, I'm still a youngster, so I'm like, Pat, I'm scrappy. I'm like, let me look at these game checks. They were 400000 and 500000 uncashed. So while I'm putting them in the glove compartment, I'm like, Ted, it's like $900,000 right here. You haven't even cashed it yet. He said, that ain't my game checks, man. That's my off-season stuff. Put that up, Wilder, and stop being in my business. And my mind went, boom. I'm like, this dude is different, man. I couldn't believe it. He just had it there trashed out with McDonald's wrappers. Unreal. Okay, yeah. So, so last one here from me, okay? Uh, as Steve mentioned, you grow up in Compton, you go to Columbia, and then your first, you, after Marv's last year, your, your next head coach is a guy from Texas, I mean, as country bumpkin as it gets. So how weird was that to go from, I mean, you had him as a defensive coordinator, so you kind of knew, but just having Wade and that personality, you know, good old country boy as a head coach, that had to be like an adjustment. Oh, Wade is still a friend of mine, man. I respect them so much. And so you go from Marv Levy, who you revere, and you're like, that's Marv Levy. And every time he would talk, it was so inspirational and educational. It was, it was a different approach to motivating the group. And whether it was a Civil War story, Revolutionary War, like Marvel pulled out a story from anywhere. And he was so intelligent that it would always hit home. And then you get Wade, who was a man of fewer words, but they still packed that punch. Wade got a bad rap. Um, one, because he is just a guy's like, hey, whatever. He seems that way. But I remember vividly how Wade said, I would never be the guy dog cursing you on Sunday. Because that would just tell everyone, I didn't do my job Monday through Saturday preparing you. And it was interesting watching Wade without his headset go out there, win 10 games, win 11 games, win games, because we were fully prepared. Now, we know he got caught up in the tug of war of Rob Johnson, Doug Flutie, and how Ralph Wilson, and how all that really played out um, behind the scenes. But if we win that Music City Miracle game, we win that Tennessee game, we go to the Super Bowl, who knows what happens. Um, it's a different conversation about the legacy of Wade Phillips as a head coach. I think it's solidified as great as a defensive coordinator. But as a head coach, I'm someone who always props him up because Wade would have you fully prepared with very little fat in terms of that prop process and preparation. I truly respect the plan for him. Yeah, good stuff. Marcellus, thanks for spending some time with us, man. It's great seeing you. You look great. Oh, man, I appreciate you guys. And tell the Bills, man, we're that close. Last year was about can we do it? Now we will do it because I think the guys believe. So looking forward to seeing them blossom this year. Good right, to Marcellus. catch up with you, Marcel. Let's take it easy. All right. All Thanks right, for your time. Care, okay, Steve, we close up this episode of One Bill's Light with something I felt that you could speak on. We've heard for a few years now about how tightly knit this Bills team is, how guys aren't afraid to use the word love in describing how close this group is under Sean McDermott. Now, I'm not naive enough to think those kinds of bonds with teammates supersedes the money <laughs> in the free agent market. Players ultimately do what's best for their families. But with your experiences when your contract was up and being part of what was a very close-knit Bills team in the early 90s, how much 
does wanting to stay with the teammates you've bonded with weigh into the free agent decision we'll see here in Buffalo and elsewhere in the league for guys like John Feliciano, who clearly, you know, is tight with Josh Allen. Sure. And, you know, Daryl Williams, who played on a cheap contract this year and deserves big money sure. now. Like, how does that all weigh in? Like, maybe reference personal experience or or some other teammates of yours? It, it does weigh in some. Uh, and if you get a comparative offer, I mean, very close offer, you could say, yeah, I'm going to do it. But say, for instance, if, if it's Matt Milano and the Bills are saying, listen, we can give you 7.5 a year for three years or four years, 7.5 a year average, and you're probably going to see all that money. And, and you know, they give you, we'll give you 15 of it up front. And, you know, you structure yeah. it that way. But you get another team <clears throat> that is going to give you 11.5 a year. Yeah. Over a three, over a four year, same length of contract, and give you half of it up front. There's really no decision to be made, yeah. particularly. And I know this too. If guys say, "Well, what about your wife and kids wanting to stay in Buffalo? They have friends here." And I get all of that. Yeah, but you're school talking about and that thing. You're yeah. talking about leaving seven figures, like between five and ten million dollars, just saying no to that extra money. Yeah. Extra money. Um, you just can't do that as a responsible father and husband. Even if you go to a place that is a train wreck. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. If you're going to Houston, and it's a mess down yeah. there, but you're going to get between 5 and $10 million more, you're talking about the same wife and kids going with you down there. And I, you just cannot responsibly leave that kind of money in this economy, in this day and age. That's life-changing money. That's, that's a big difference for you, your wife, your children's future. For you're saying for three or four years, like yeah. just going to college, right? You can't. You can live through that for three or four years, for for what amounts to sixteen months over three or four years. Going in, spending from from July through. If you're not going to the playoffs, July through December. Yeah. You you have to say yeah. I got to take that Be, and and say and your buddies will understand your your friends who love you and respect you. You've played with. They're going to say, hey, listen, you got to take it. Yeah. Because. When push comes to shove, the love and, and respect you have for your friends is real. Your friends will tell you the same thing. Bro, you can't turn that down. I lo- I'm going to love you whether you're a Buffalo Bill or a Houston Texan. Yeah, That's the truth of the matter. Usually a tight-knit team and a winning team are one and the same because you know that culture usually breeds success. So does the player bond or the winning organization carry more weight? Because you had both of those factors right. here. You know, when you were playing, I'm just curious, are they one and the same or do you separate it? Does one really carry more weight than the other? Like everybody wants to play for it's, a winner, obviously, but <clears throat> it's the yin and the yang. Yeah. You know, chicken um, and the egg. Yes, yeah, the chicken and the egg. Do, great teams seem to share that common element of if you're on this team, you're loved and respected and you love the guy. Yeah, it's ride awesome. or die. It's great. It, let's go. I'm with you 100%. And bad teams don't have that. Mm hmm. Now, it's easy to have a good time and be f- and all lovey-dovey and all that when you're winning every week, too. Um, and you don't win without good players. Uh, I think it's a, a, a more pointed question is, are the best players on your team the reason for both scenarios? Mm. Are the best players on your team the reason you're winning? Yeah, okay, that's easy to say, probably. But are they also the reason... Everybody loves and respects each other. If that's the case, that's your answer. That's your answer. The wow. best players on the roster have to be the guys who love everybody the most. And, I, and they have to work hard. And the good part about that is I think you have that here in Buffalo right now. Josh Allen, Stephon Diggs, right. Tredavious White. T- Tremaine Edmonds. Yeah. Jordan those Poyer, guys, those guys that are 100% in are also – the guys who, Dawkins. who drive the ship, mm-hmm. they are they are in it, and they work. And you know, you can ask the co- they work hard. They are committed to being better today than they yeah. were yesterday. That is that's the holy grail. The the lovey, you know, the the all the camaraderie and the and the the atmosphere of that team is great. 
<clears throat> but if you've got superstar players that you're really depending on and they're not kind of they're like yeah, I got you I'm I'm okay yeah 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 all that stuff's fine but I it's about you know it's about me I got to do my thing that undermines it right yeah. so <clears throat> so what they have here actually enhances it that's right and that's what you know, it's the same thing with that 90s team as well it, mm-hmm. it was about certainly we had a, we had five hall of fame guys walking onto the field at any given moment yeah. <laughs> so and all five of those guys were just Awesome. I mean, they, they were, we knew as some role players like me that those guys were like, if, if, if they needed to be, at, if they were asked to do something, they're going to do it. And they're going to do it hard and, you know, as, the to the best level. of their ability and they're going to work at doing it. They were in. So got all the role players down through the roster like me were like, okay, I got to do, you know, I got, I'm in, you know, let's go. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's, it that's reinforces it. the, so the come right. It's, it's more about, and it's about who plays that role. If you're a truly, tremendously great guy, you elevate other players around you because of the work ethic you possess, the amount of unselfishness you display every day during the week, every day in practice, about trying to get them better as well as yourself better. Because guys know you've already made it. A, a, you've got a, a garage full of cash. But you're still out there grinding it and doing it and helping everybody else get yeah. better, and you're all about them. Man, oh man, that that isn't that hasn't that's almost the magic the magic elixir of having a great team. This is why we have Steve here to ask him these things. So uh, good on that, excellent insight there. That is all the time we have this week. We thank you for listening. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to our weekly episodes, and remember. When there isn't enough time for One Bills Live, Monday to Friday, there is always enough time for One Bills Live. For Steve Tasker, I'm Chris Brown. We'll see you next week, everybody.